apprentice model just, just up until now, today, and uh, a lot of great people, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure. I, I noticed, uh, you know, everybody in the community is thinking about, well, what can we do to really improve things for our community and have it really, you know, pr uh, prevail or succeed or grow, and that could be to create an infrastructure, as we heard in the first talk today, which was a really inspiring. Um, it, it, it could be just to get mass adoption. I think that would be a huge win. Now, I don't mean to be simple-minded, but it seems to me that the real key thing about blockchain has really simply been the un permissionness of it, that it avoids regulation and control by powers that be. That's where the real opportunity comes. When I hear about how it can be used to recreate a lot of existing uh, institutional structures and so on, it's interesting but not that inspiring to me. It's not even clear that's necessary. And I wouldn't think that that would be a real win for the community because the thing that brought me into the blockchain is the ethos. And part of that is about enabling you know, digital sovereignty, uh, giving, returning control to people over their informational lives. And I think right now we're seeing an urgency in that regard because of several trends that are all coming together rather quickly. And for instance, I've never seen mainstream media turn against giant tech companies ever. And they really did against Facebook and, and Google and so on when people started realizing that their personal information was in their network of friends and everything was being, so-called metadata, was being spied upon and used without their permission to, to make money and then later to actually manipulate the political processes around the world to steal people's freedom. Moreover, in like, you know, other parts of the world where people don't have that much freedom, actually, the same exact technology really is being used to kind of perfect that lack of freedom in, in, in frightening ways. So globally, we're seeing the capture of so-called metadata that is information about what we do, where we are, who, are, who we contact, when, how much we talk, and so on, being used to cause a lot of problems for people, and people are starting to wake up to this, and they're not very happy about it. So I think it's a moment in time for us because, you know, another trend is regulation. And regulation is amping up, slowly but surely, here and there. It's not like we have all the time in the world to create an unpermissioned blockchain of our dreams, right? It, it, we're under time pressure there, and we have a tremendous opportunity at this time because people are really very uh, pissed off, I would say, or very unhappy about what's, what's going on and, and concerned about it and aware of it, and you even see it in the, in the mainstream media. So if you look at the sweet spot, what is it that people want to do with this technology that ordinary consumers want to do? Well, the answer is actually proven. It's a simple fact that WeChat has 1.2 billion users, last time I looked, probably more by now, and that Facebook is moving aggressively to try to offer the same thing, which is messaging combined with payments and then a platform for some kind of, of, of apps. So, and this is the same business model that most of the big messaging platforms 
other beyond the ones that Facebook owns are moving toward. So it's pretty clear that's what people want. That's what consumers want, but they don't want the metadata to be captured and used against them. So if there were to be a metadata shredding payment and messaging platform that has apps in it, that, that because of its, its unpermissioned, fully distributed nature, actually guaranteed that metadata was, was shredded as it was created, then that would be something that the public would move to. Don't make, you know, it's been the history of, don't make the mistake of thinking that just because there's a jillion users on this or that social media platform, that they won't later move to the next one that, that solves their problems, right? So I think there's plenty of opportunity here to imagine that the public will move from these institutions that have betrayed them and are causing a real danger to them to something which is an unpermissioned, distributed platform that protects they are, that shreds the metadata and gives them the messaging and payments that they want with, with apps, with apps, if you will. I, I think that's the, the real opportunity to, to get users, and a lot of people think that's what's needed to make blockchain a, a big success or to create a platform, and it's, it's a similar thing. And so, but I don't think we have all the time in the world to do it. Uh, I don't think the ways, I mean, I love games and so on, but I, I, don't, I don't, I think we should pull together and try to make something that's real and focus on that and, and try to go for the, for the, for the, uh, the, the thing that will protect all of our freedoms going forward. So then we'll have time to, you know, really enjoy virtual reality. The world we, will be very different with a metadata shredding killer app like that that protects people's per, you know, individual sovereignty and, and, and the informational world. And then we can enjoy all the, all the other stuff, like virtual reality and uh, uh, games and so on. So but anyways, let me just point out that it's only a year ago that I announced our little company, Elixir, and here in Asia, and uh, since then we, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time on the road. I've seen many of you in many places, and it's been it's been really great. It's a little bit taxing for me uh, at my age, but uh, my health. But anyway, I've done it, and I've put together, and you'll see, so we've put together actually two really great teams, and. We have received a lot of support from the community, so we have over 600 nodes have signed up for our beta program without compensation through a totally transparent process that started with a survey what the best way to do it would be and ended with you know, dispute resolution processes and all that. So we've got now the three teams of the beta nodes and we've also uh, got a, well, this, uh, these numbers are good, well, about several thousand users of our XX Collective app, and I urge you to download it because there's a lot, of, a lot of cool things that will benefit you from doing so. And so you'll see it on, you know, it's on Android and iOS, and uh, one of the reasons people are downloading is to get a place in line for our messaging system, and there are other reasons, and you can see all the stuff that we're up to. Um, we, so what, another thing you can see in the app, you can actually watch the alpha network performance uh, and, and metrics and so on in real time there. And so we have the alpha nodes and the, uh, also uh, our so we'll have SDK developers and using our open APIs and uh, libraries for access to our uh, messaging system. Okay, but. Actually, I'm here to talk about something complementary but different, which is, we call it Praxis. It's a sister organization for Elixir, and it has committed to get its white paper out this year. 
hopefully this will, this will happen, it looks like it can. And when it does, it's going to be a revolutionary thing. It might be very different from consensus and currency solutions that you have seen to date. And part of the reason for that is because it's based on all the years I've been working on all this stuff. How many people think I started working on consensus after Bitcoin? Nobody, good. Because I, I started working on it in 1982. I published my dissertation at Berkeley. And if you look at my Wikipedia page, you'll see a reference to an article that says basically that I, uh, all the aspects of permission and permission chains were in my dissertation and specification language except for the uh, proof of work, which you know came uh, more than 10 years later. So um, the, uh, I've also done a lot of, if you look at my homepage, and I urge you to do that, chom.com, C-H-A-U-M.com, there you'll see like the, the eCash Museum, you can see that I invented electronic money in 82, and then it's a, it launched the DigiCash company, and in, in 1994 made the first electronic money payment over the internet, and that was the first digital bearer instrument, a number that was worth money, created a lot of interest, and we issued, I did an airdrop, you can see all the shops that opened to accept our currency, and then uh, later we also allowed several banks, in fact, including the largest bank in Europe, or also used dollars and Australia to issue electronic uh, currency in, uh, in their fiat currency in those days. But anyways, and I've got some really interesting stuff on voting, which I urge you to look at, but I can't have time to get into that here. It's relevant, to, very relevant to blockchain, and this, the, in, the scrutiny that's needed on very individual code updates for security reasons. So basically, the, the uh, Elixir system needs high speed, scalability, high, it has to be quantum resistant, and it, it needs to be able to protect privacy, and that creates unique requirements on the consensus algorithm, and, 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 and that's why we built this. And you know, another trend that's happened, and I don't want to belabor this, but quantum computers could take down a lot of chains. And when I was growing up, we used to say, it was a very popular expression, the revolution will not be televised. Okay, so it, you know, in other words, if some national, uh, you know, uh, 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 entity wishes to like disrupt these chains because they're starting to pose a problem to their plans to dominate world currencies and stuff like that, which is a, is a war that's underway, they're not going to announce that they have quantum computers that can break this stuff. They're just going to, they'll just, one day to the next, they'll just take, take all this stuff down. Steal all the money or just publish all the private keys or something like that. So you, 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 you know, really it's, it's, you can't just add quantum security on, you can add it on in a certain way, but not fundamentally. You gotta really, gotta really, we got to architect a, a new kind of electronic money that has built in very strong quantum resistance and that is uh, amenable to privacy protection. It turns out the original eCash that we issued in the 90s was based on fixed denomination. So we had binary denomination, one cent, two cent, four cent, eight cent, 16 cent coins. So it was like paper money and metal coins. Unlike current blockchains, which are basically like checks, they move money from this account to this account, right? So the, having this sort of containerized chunks of money inherently already starts to make better privacy and better metadata protection. But when you integrate that with the, which we will, with the Elixir messaging, then you have privacy and payments and messaging, and they're both hidden together like the world has never seen and has not really anticipated even 